a dramatic shootout with a suspected bomber in broad daylight. There's a guy sh gun, shots fired. Taken down in a gunfight with police, the moment he is chased by two officers, both shot during the arrest, and what we're now learning about the suspect. The new surveillance footage as he planted those bombs, his trip overseas, and what authorities found in his home. And terror is front and center on the campaign trail. I'm saying you're going to have to profile. All We're right. going to have to start profiling. Hillary Clinton calls Donald Trump's comments fuel for ISIS as his son and advisor Donald Trump Jr. sparks outrage with a tweet comparing Syrian refugees to Skittles. The dramatic new video revealing the tense moments of a deadly police shooting. That looks like a bad dude. A man apparently with car trouble, surrounded by officers, his hands in the air, but shot dead. The investigation this morning. And comedian Jim Carrey hit with a wrongful death lawsuit, accusing him of buying drugs for his late girlfriend, using a fake name, and trying to cover up his involvement. The Hollywood mystery and the text message at the center of the case. Live in Times Square, this is GMA with Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, and Michael Strahan. And we do say good morning, America. We are learning new details about the suspected bomber, Ahmad Khan Rahami, believed to be responsible for those Manhattan and New Jersey explosives. Authorities are now trying to determine if others were involved. Decisive moments unfolded on live TV. There you see him being wheeled into an ambulance right there. Rahami, after a shootout with police, our New York station, WABC TV, was there for all of those moments. He looked a little disoriented there. It was quite dramatic late mm -hmm. morning yesterday. And um, if you were in the New York area yesterday, you likely saw this alert on your phone Monday morning. Millions of people got the sub suspect's name and age sent right to their devices. The first time the alert system was used for something like this. And it appears that it was quite effective. Amy Robach is on the scene where the suspect was caught hours after that alert went out in Linden, New Jersey. Good morning, Amy. Good morning, Robin. Yes, it all went down right behind me. Rahami was found sleeping inside a hallway in that brick building there behind me. A concerned citizen called police. They quickly responded, never expecting to ultimately find and capture the most wanted man in America. Ahmed Khan Rahami taken into custody after more than 48 hours of terror. That's a terrorist. Man, this is crazy. Bystanders capturing the moment gunfire erupts as police confront the suspect in Linden, New Jersey. It had to be around like 15, 15 to 20 shots. There's a guy shooting a gun. Surveillance video shows Rahami fleeing on foot. A police squad car nearly ramming him. He makes a run for it, gun in hand. He began to engage them and they returned fire and, and it actually went down the street and it is just a miracle that no innocent civilians were hit, uh, thank God. Uh, but it, it took a while to, uh, to capture the suspect. The sweeping manhunt started around 8 a.m. Monday morning after authorities pinpointed Rahami as the suspect suspected bomber who planted several bombs in New York and New Jersey. They just released his information. This is a suspect that's been wanted in the New York City and Seaside bombing. Rahami, seen in this video obtained by WCBS, pulling a suitcase authorities believe contained one of those pressure cooker bombs Saturday night. Rahami's takedown began at 10.30 a.m. when the owner of this local bar spotted a suspicious man sleeping in his doorway. Shortly before that, Rahami seen on surveillance camera at this local gas station. Responding officers immediately recognized the bearded man as Rahami. Went for his gun towards his left side, and that's when I'm presuming the cop must have yelled at him to show me the hand. Officers Angel Padilla and Peter Hammer wounded in the shootout. He's my inspiration. He, what he did is it's commendable. Um, I'm proud of him. Uh, he's the reason why I'm a police officer myself. Rahami shot several times, his arm and leg bandaged. The bomb that's suspect him. right there. Look at him. 90 minutes after the shootout began, the suspect detained. Rushed to University Hospital in Newark, where he underwent surgery. Right now, Rahami is being held on $5.2 million bail. He is only charged in connection with the shootout that happened yesterday, but of course, more charges are expected to be filed in connection with the bombings. And word is he is not cooperating with police guys, even refusing to give his name at this hour. Back to you. We will see if that changes over time. Amy, thanks very much. Let's get more on Rahami's past now from our chief investigative correspondent, Brian Ross. And Brian, Rahimi's travels overseas a real focus of the investigation. 
That's right, George, and good morning. U.S. officials are pressing for more information about that mysterious year-long foreign trip Rahami took two years ago to Pakistan and Afghanistan, and whether that was the turning point for a young man who friends say once spent most of his time talking about cars, sports, and girls. As a teenager, Rahami attended high school in Edison, New Jersey, where he graduated in 2007, remembered as a clean-cut kid. Shocked classmates took to Facebook to express their outrage, recalling this picture of him and good times at a high school pool party. Someone shared that on Facebook, tagged it, and said, I can't believe I used to be friends with this guy. As a senior, classmates say Rahami actually became a father. Ahmed had a girlfriend um, who became pregnant, who was far along in her pregnancy at the prom. After a year at junior college, Rahami ended up working at the family restaurant, First American Fried Chicken. Five years ago, his family sued the city of Elizabeth, New Jersey, claiming discrimination against Muslims because the city imposed a 10 o'clock closing time. We had some code enforcement problems and noise complaints. Rahami appears to have longed for his family roots with several trips to Afghanistan and Pakistan. In April 2013, officials say he traveled to Quetta, Pakistan, a known hotbed of extremism, then traveled on to Afghanistan, not returning to the U.S. until almost a year later in March 2014, causing U.S. officials to question him on his return. They're going to look at where he said he went. Does it match? Or did he go off to some rogue mosque or hook up with somebody that could have trained him to become a terrorist? Officials say he claimed he was visiting Pakistan to see a wife there who he tried but failed to bring back into the country. And officials this morning tell ABC News a number of his relatives remain in Pakistan, Afghan refugees, and that his mother left the country here in the U.S., left the U.S. just three weeks ago and has not returned since. George. And Brian, they think that the bombs are sophisticated enough that he might have needed training. Exactly. Two different kinds of bombs he used, at least. Okay, Brian Ross, thanks very much. We're going to talk more about that, gentlemen. For more in the investigation, let's turn to ABC senior justice correspondent Pierre Thomas and former New York City Police Commissioner Ray Kelly, who's here in the studio with us. Pierre, let me start with you. What are your sources telling you about the investigation where it stands right now? What's the latest? Good morning, Robin. Sources are telling me the focus right now is on the last six months to a year of Rahami's life. Who was he talking to? Who was he associating with? They're searching through any phones and computers tied to him to examine his social media footprint, trying to determine whether he was radicalized by ISIS or al-Qaeda. Some sources suspect he got his bomb-making design from a deadly cookbook posted on al-Qaeda's Inspire magazine. They're also trying to trace his travel during that 2013 trip to Af Afghanistan and Pakistan. They want to know who he made contact with there. And that trip was long ago, but officials are leaving no stone unturned. Every aspect of his life is being dissected, Robin. And another question they're asking, did he get any help? Anybody else involved with these bombings? The official word right now is no evidence of a terror cell supporting him, but my sources emphasize it's so early in the investigation, they need to know a lot more about this man, and they need to know if there's somebody else out there who knew what he was planning to do. All right, Pierre, thank you. And um, Ray, uh, Rick, what can you tell us about what law enforcement is focusing on about the bombs? Well, lots of questions on the part of uh, law enforcement. As was said, accomplices are what it's all, uh, all about uh, right now, were their family members in involved. The bombs themselves were fairly basic but there were two different types of bombs there was a the pipe bombs using black powder there were the pressure cooker bombs using what's called a tannerite so where did he get these materials where did he build the bomb uh, wires were found in the apartment i'm told uh, yesterday so uh, these are questions that are going to be uh, asked by investigators as soon as this individual will, uh, if he doesn't cooperate, obviously they can't get it from him, but they'll be asking his, his family and his uh, uh, companions. Uh, the question is also, what was the radicalization process mm -hmm. for this individual? And again, obviously a lot of focus on the trip uh, overseas. We know that he went to other places, and as, as was said, is he telling the truth as to, to where he went? Did he go to Turkey or, or Syria? Uh, and obviously the, these trips are going to be the the uh, uh, foundation for much more in-depth investigations. Well, hopefully we can get them to open up about those things. We hope. All right, but thank you, Ray. Hey, guys, thanks. Now to how this all plays in the race for the White House. Just 49 days until the final votes, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton traded sharp attacks all day on terror and national security. ABC's Tom Yamas is in Fort Myers, Florida, where Trump held a fiery rally last night. Good morning, Tom.
George, good morning to you. Donald Trump out with some colorful thoughts about that bombing suspect and how he's being treated right now. But it's his son, Donald Trump Jr., who's making headlines this morning. Overnight, Donald Trump sharing his theory of why bombing suspect Ahmad Khan Rahami apparently wasn't on any type of watch list. The guy over the chicken stand brought litigation, a lot of litigation against different people, and I'll bet you that's why he was on no list. You know, he was on no list. They yeah, probably the didn't list. want to put him because they didn't right. want to get sued. Trump railing against Rahami during a massive rally in Fort Myers, Florida predicting authorities would be coddling him. He will be given a fully modern and updated hospital room. And he'll probably even have room service knowing the way our country is. The Republican nominee blaming homegrown terror on lax policies and again calling for increased profiling. I'm saying you're going to have to profile. Right. We're going to have to start profiling. Hillary Clinton focusing her policy on outreach. It is crucial that we continue to build up trust between law enforcement and Muslim American communities. And accusing Trump of motivating ISIS with his words and actions. We've heard that from former CIA director Michael Hayden, who made it a very clear point when he said Donald Trump is being used as a recruiting sergeant for the terrorists. Trump's son, Don Jr., also getting into the debate and drawing some fire for this tweet, which reads, if I had a bowl of Skittles and I told you three would kill you, would you take a handful? That's our Syrian refugee problem. The tweet igniting outrage from people saying Don Jr. shouldn't be comparing Syrian refugees to pieces of candy. A Clinton campaign spokesperson responding, calling it disgusting. And the Mars Corporation out with their own statement this morning via Twitter. Let's put it up on the screen. Here's the tweet. It reads, Skittles are candy, refugees are people. It's an inappropriate analogy. We respectfully refrain from further comment as that could be misinterpreted as marking. But, George, this comment and those tweets are blowing up on social media Boy, this morning. they sure are. George. A real pattern there. Okay, Tom, thanks very much. Let's bring in John Carl for more on that. So you got those tweets blowing up right there. You saw Donald Trump at the rally, and he and Hillary Clinton di diametrically opposed positions on terror, yet they're close in our poll, 48% to 45%. Yeah, and Republicans always have a big advantage on the issue of terrorism, going back to 9-11. But in this race, it's largely taken away. In our, our poll, within the margin of error, in some polls, he has a slight advantage, in others, she has a slight advantage. But they could not be more different on this Hillary Clinton emphasizing sober, steady leadership, and Donald Trump channeling that anger, that raw emotion, that raw anger at terrorism. And you know why she is doing it, because you see a big difference on who Americans think can handle an international crisis. She has a huge advantage right there. She has the big advantage on the commander-in-chief test. It's much closer when it's who can respond to the terrorists. She's also carving out a different spot than Barack Obama on this. It was interesting to see her come out before the president to condemn these attacks, to brand them as terrorism before the president. She's trying to find a ground between Donald Trump and Barack Obama. Some other political stories out there. You saw Chris Christie yesterday. There's that trial on the George Washington Bridge scandal a couple years back, the Bridgegate scandal. Prosecutors now saying he knew about the traffic jams, yet Donald Trump's standing by him. Uh, absolutely, but if you remember during the primaries, George, Donald Trump came out and said, of course Chris Christie knew. He definitely knew. I mean, he was emphatic. So perhaps the person least surprised by this allegation is Donald Trump himself. He's sticking to Christie, and in doing so, he's saying he's sticking to him because Christie has always stood Standing by him. By, I mean, meanwhile, maybe a big defection on the Republican side from Donald Trump, but the news is coming from a member of the Kennedy family. Yeah, this is unbelievable. The two most famous political families in America, the Kennedys and, and, and the Bushes. And this was Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, the oldest child of Robert and Ethel Kennedy, visited, there you see her, visited uh, with uh, former President Bush up in Maine. And she says that he said that he's voting for Hillary Clinton. Now, the interesting thing is there's no denial from the Bush family on this. The spokesperson simply says nobody overheard their conversation. And of course, Jeb Bush has said he's not, <laughs> 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 has said he's not voting for um, Trump, but has not said he's voting for Hillary. Yeah, exactly. John Carl, thanks very much. Of course, the debate less than a week away. I'll be anchoring our primetime coverage at 9 Eastern with a analysis from our whole political team. Much for the two candidates to discuss. Mm -hmm. But turning now to that fatal roadside shooting by police in Oklahoma. Newly released video raising questions about why an unarmed man was shot and killed. ABC's Clayton Sandell is in Tulsa with the moments that were caught on tape. Good morning, Clayton. 
Hey, good morning. Good morning, Robin. And yeah, those videos are disturbing. And police here in Tulsa tell me they are so concerned by what they see here, they've now asked the Department of Justice to help investigate. This morning, there are many questions over how a man who appeared to be having car trouble ended up shot dead by police. Somebody left their vehicle running in the middle of the street with the doors wide open. After that 911 call Friday night, Tulsa police officer Betty Shelby arrives, finding Terrence Crutcher in the street. She radios he isn't cooperating. Hold traffic. I've got a subject or show me his hands. Minutes later, with at least four officers surrounding Crutcher, his hands are raised, but he seems to ignore their commands. This guy's still walking. Not for taser, I think. That looks like a bad dude, too. It's hard to make out what happens next. Police say Crutcher makes a move for something inside his car. One officer fires his taser. Officer Shelby fires her gun. Shot fired! Crutcher's family believes the shooting is part of what they call an epidemic of unarmed people of color killed by police. That big bad dude was my twin brother. That big bad dude was a father. Tulsa's police chief now says the 40-year-old was unarmed. Uh, I'm going to tell you right here now, there was no gun on the suspect or in the suspect's vehicle. Crutcher's family says he didn't deserve to die, but that Officer Shelby deserves to be charged. I want that officer to be held to the same standard. And we just want justice for my brother so he'll know as he looks down on us that his life truly mattered. Now, the decision on whether or not that officer will face charges, federal or state, could take weeks. In the meantime, that officer is on paid leave. Guys, back to you. And for the police chief to come out immediately and say there was no gun on the gentleman and no gun in his vehicle. Right away, he made that clear. Big statement. Yeah. Yeah. Big statement made. All right, everybody, take a look at this. This is what you unfortunately might see if you try and get gas today in the southeast. A broken, a broken pipeline is causing prices to skyrocket in our Steve Osinsami has more on the pressure at the pump. For drivers running on fumes, it's frightening. These are the signs turning them away from gas stations across the Deep South. No service, no fuel, the gas is sold out. We try to get some gas and they don't have any. It's frustrating. We don't have no gas right now, it's like crazy. Adding insult to injury, some service stations are having a jolly good time raising prices. One station in North Carolina was reportedly charging as much as $4.50 a gallon. The state's attorney general says he's heard more than 600 reports of possible price gouging. All my money's going to gas. I feel like we're being charged unfairly. It all started 11 days ago with a leak along the Colonial Pipeline in Alabama, which provides the East Coast with nearly 40% of its gasoline. Nearly 300,000 gallons spilled into this pond. Hundreds of workers are now building a bypass around the leak that they hope to finish by the end of the week. In the meanwhile, six states are officially in a state of emergency. Gas prices are up an average 16 cents a gallon in Georgia, up 11 cents a gallon in Tennessee. And AAA says that will continue until the pipeline is fully restored. We have to make sure as we're going from place to place that we have gas. So hopefully they can get the problem resolved. This service station behind me is one of many across this city that has no gas. Authorities insist that there's enough fuel supply for everyone, but not when everyone is filling up at the same time. The governor here in Georgia has issued an executive order against price gouging. It, New York. Is, it is tough when everybody has to get to work. That's true. Yep. Let's get to Ginger now more on those fires out west. Right, and this canyon fire has now tripled in size in the last 36 hours. So this one's bad, and the erratic winds, the low humidity, a big part of the problem. Oh, more than 6,000 acres at this point. We're watching tropical storm pain that should go into Baja and add a lot of moisture and only, unfortunately, dry lightning in the southern parts of California. Your local weather, 30 seconds away. First, though, Tuesday Trivia, brought to you by Kohl's. Just a girl with better clothes Where she gets them, no one knows Everything you want, she got Everything she got, you want the girl with better clothes Get $10 off your woman's fall fashion purchase of $50 or more right now at Kohl's.
And a very good morning, meteorologist Brian Vandegraaff. Outside today, gray could be a little bit of patchy fog. Showers could linger to the south. Most of the metro dry. If you head to the north and west, you get a little more in the way of some sunshine. 83 today, still above the average of 78. Low 70s tonight. Tomorrow, those clouds are still stubborn, especially to the south. Mid 80s for temperatures tomorrow. Now, as far as longer term, Thursday and Friday looking pleasant. Mid 80s and warmer. First day of fall, feeling a little more summer-like. Warm on Saturday, then a few showers and much cooler for Sunday. Coming up another.